Hello and welcome to Lab 5, Atmospheric Pressure and Wind. This video is put together to really assist you in completing this lab, to provide some tips and tricks and helpful things that will help get you through this lab a little bit faster and more efficiently. As we can see within the course objective for this lab, we're going to learn how to construct and interpret an atmospheric pressure profile. We'll be able to identify the mechanisms that drive wind, diagram a global circulation model, analyze and interpret global atmospheric pressure and temperature maps, and lastly we'll be able to explain different types of local and regional wind patterns. That being said, let's start Lab 5. So let's start with part A, measuring air pressure. Now because of the gravitational pull on the gases in the atmosphere, the greatest air pressure is at the bottom with the weight of the overlying air pushing down on its surface. So it's really interesting to think about that, but just depending on your altitude or your elevation, depending on where you are and how much atmosphere is above you, that's measuring the pressure, how much pressure or atmosphere is above you that can push down. So if you're in a place of very, very, very low elevation, you have a lot more atmosphere between you and above pushing down. So you will be experiencing really high pressure. If you're at the top of a really high mountain, you have not as much atmosphere above you now, so you're going to be experiencing lower pressure. So this lab, this first part A, starts walking us through those concepts. So as we can observe, the great diagram, figure 5.1, in the influence of gravity and air molecules, as we can see those molecules are being condensed and squished together at the bottom of this container. Higher up, they're able to spread out. Moving forward to the next page, we can learn some different terms, such as a barometer, which is the tool that it measures barometric pressure. We also can see that that is measured as inches of mercury, uh, known as inches in Hg, or millibars. So this first activity is having you use the conversion of inches um, of mercury into millibars. So it's saying, as an example, the highest recorded air pressure on Earth was measured in Mongolia, and it was 32.03 Hg. Convert that into millibars by utilizing this information right here. And the same goes through question two, three, and four. Something else that I want to explain to you before we move on to part B is that when we start looking at this idea of pressure, Think about the classic, you're driving in your car, uh, you have an empty bottle of water in the back seat, and you start heading up a mountain, and then you can hear it go, where it pops. Well, that's because as you gain altitude, those molecules are able to spread out. Air molecules can spread out because there's less pressure. So they become less dense, which means they can explode. Maybe you've seen with a bag of chips, uh, but the water bottle was always an example that I would use because it's happened many times. Uh, and the other way around, you have a water bottle that's full of air at the top of a mountain, and as you head down to the valley, you can hear it crumple up because those molecules are being crushed together because of that atmospheric pressure. That being said, that wraps up part A, and let's move towards part B. So part B is called Standard Atmospheric Pressure Profile. So as discussed earlier, gravity has a significant influence on the vertical distribution of these gases within our atmosphere. As we can observe below in Table 5.1, provides the average air pressure at a range of altitudes. So Question 5 is having us look at that information and to graph it. So here's the information we have altitude and the average pressure at that altitude. As we can see, the higher the altitude, the lower the pressure. So we can see on this graph here, we have a blank graph based on altitude and air pressure. So as it says, I'm going to scroll up again. Question 2 says, using the table, 5.1, graph the atmospheric pressure profile on the graph provided and then connect the data points with a solid line. So again, we're going to uh, oops, excuse me. We're going to then move over here, take this information, and plot it on this graph. Then, part six here, question six is using that completed figure, answer the following questions. A, the highest peak in California, and really the continental US, is Mount Whitney. What type of pressure are they experiencing in Mount Whitney? What type of pressure are they experiencing at these other locations? So go ahead and answer questions six, part A, B, and C, and D, regarding the graph that you plotted that data on. 
then as we move forward. Question seven says, what is the highest elevation on the surface, not in a plane, that you've been to? So this is for you to then research that place. Maybe it's been a place in Mammoth or Big Bear, or maybe you really haven't had a lot of opportunity to travel far, or maybe you've traveled, you know, <laughs> you know, over the pond into other, you know, countries. So be sure to include that. That'll be kind of fun to read your answer. That being said, that wraps up part B. Let's move into part C. C is looking at the global mechanisms of wind. Wind is the horizontal movement of air across the surface of the earth. Although the main driver of wind is the difference in surface pressure, there are other factors that can interact and drive the winds. In this section, we're going to learn a little bit more about what those factors might be. The first one will be gravity. And so this diagram, figure 5.3, is explaining you know, how gravity can limit air movement. The next part is looking at pressure gradient. Although in the previous section we learned that on average the atmospheric pressure is about 1013.25 millibars, the pressure can vary and we can see that there's a gradient that can be observed. Moving into this next piece here, we're able to observe this diagram, a classic high pressure and low pressure system. This is very fundamental. We'll, you know, we'll kind of make it more advanced later on in this lab, but just understanding the differences between high and low pressure. High pressure is all that air pushing down, and we have an area in which is receiving higher pressure than normally around that region. And then in low pressure systems, we find that because of merging air, it's being forced and pushed upward. And so that spot there will be experiencing lower pressure than in other places. We also have the Coriolis effect. So we know that the Earth is rotating counterclockwise, and because of that, things in the northern hemisphere are often deflected to the right. Things in the southern hemisphere are deflected to the left. So not just things in motion, but also air and wind and will eventually discover extreme weather as well. So we can observe this diagram, make sure you take a, a, a moment to read the caption and what happens within there. And then here's a brief video by the United Kingdom's Meteorological Office that explains the Coriolis effect. Uh, scan that QR code or click the link. Another factor when it comes to just wind and all, all what we're going to be discussing is friction. Uh, the upper atmospheric winds are called geostrophic winds. Uh, they're pulled evenly by the pressure gradient and the, cor uh, the Coriolis effect. So these high altitude winds typically run parallel to the lines of equal pressure. So as we see, here's a pennant, something to really think about as we move forward. These four factors influence atmospheric circulation gravity, pressure, Coriolis effect, and friction, which brings us to this diagram here, 5.6, the combined factors that influence wind near the surface of the Earth. And I think this is a great image that Scott put together for us for this lab, because you're able to what I call putting it together. We have all these, you know, these four attributes. How can I visualize them in one spot? And here's a great example of both a high pressure and a low pressure, and looking at how all these different attributes can work together. Moving forward within this, we can see now a little bit more of a transition into what we would identify as weather maps. So as the air moves away from a high pressure system and closer towards a lower pressure system, all three factors have an influence on that air movement. And we can see these arrows are being depicted there, saying the resulting wind direction near the surface of the Earth in the northern hemisphere. Uh, Question 8 says in table 5.2, which is down below, indicate the movement of air in high and low pressure systems for each hemisphere. Fill in the table using one of the two choices given in italics on the far left. So again, because of the Coriolis effect, we know that things are often deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere, but it also depends on whether it is a high pressure or a low pressure. So the image above, 5.7, is as it specifically states, is for the northern hemispheres with the actual direction in which things move flip in the southern hemisphere. So you'll be able to fill that out, and once you fill that out, you're going to learn more about the differences between High, high pressure, known as anticyclone, and low pressure systems known as cyclonic or cyclones. Question 9 says the circles represent 
isobars. That's these circles here around. Isobars are similar to contour lines in that they represent a specific value. In this case, since they're isobars, they represent pressure. So they, you know, every, just like on a contour map where one line represents all the same elevation here, this one line, 1000 MB or millibars, represents 1000 millibars all the way across that diagram. So it says the arrows represent that we see up here, uh, represent the surface wind direction in the direction of each of these little systems write an H or an L indicating whether it's high or low and that's gonna be on the next diagram here so here we have 5.3 diagram A B C and D and you need to decide is it a high pressure low pressure is it in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere so uh, again to really work through this I think it's very helpful to take this image as an example this information you've been able to plug in and then again you kind of put it together and you get to see it in a diagram. Now question 10 says on figure 5.8 which is down below label the center of the high pressure with an H and the, and the center of the low pressure with an L. Draw arrows showing the direction of air movement within each of these pressure areas and then draw a single arrow showing the direction of the surface air movement between these two pressure areas. Assume that they are in the northern hemisphere. So essentially what you get to do in this map is exactly what's been done on page 8 on the earlier page. You get to now create your own weather map. So you're becoming and you're going to earn your little meteorological uh, badge of honor by doing this here. Now moving forward, we can see that we're going to start part D. So let's get ready to start now the next part of the global circulation model. So how can we observe all of these high pressure, low pressures, and all these values of atmospheric conditions in some form of model that big putting it together and that's what we identify as the global circulation model so in order before we just jump into that model we have to kind of work up to it so what we have here to begin is it says before we take a look at the components of global atmospheric circulation it's going to be helpful for you to know the terminology related to the latitudinal zones figure 5.9 points those out so we can see that we have our special lines of latitude and others that have been denoted on this map projection. We can also see that there are regions, as an example, you know, between 23.5 uh, degrees and 35 degrees south is what we consider subtropical. We also have mid-latitude, subarctic, and arctic areas. And that's really important for us to understand because especially as we move forward between the next lab and then later on when we talk more about climate, which is long-term weather, this is very important for us to understand this terminology. So question 11 has you refer to those items and for you to answer questions based on those items. As an example, uh, part A says, what, what is the range of latitudes for tropical latitudinal zones? And you just plug all that information in. Then as we move forward, we learn more about the fact that, you know, as warm air rises, cool air sinks, you know, we can start developing weather systems. So it says here on the next page that we can start plotting some of this information. So question 12 says, based on what you know about the global circulation model, complete table 5.4. You may need to refer to your lecture notes or textbook and or watch the guided practice video. So this guided practice video is a great video that our friend Scott put together for us. You can scan that QR code or hit the hyperlink and he actually talks about the global circulation and allows you to be able to plug in some of the attributes that are needed on this table. You know, for myself personally, it's very important that you take the time to plug in this, this due diligence because these are great references for when you come to exams to be able to go back and to understand, you know, whether it be a high or low pressure area or a region within that polar region, subpolar, subtropical, and so on and so forth. It really begins to paint the picture of how dynamic our weather systems are because of our atmospheric circulation. You know, we've kind of danced around the idea of climate, and you know, climate change is a hot, you know, term that's you know very important right now, politically and socially. And when we talk about climate, climate's long term. Thirty years of data has to be collected for us to understand a specific climate for a region. So when we're saying that we're observing climate change, that means we have seen progressive change over thirty years. So you know, this is a way for us to understand that science a little bit more. 
Now, question 13 says, now using the simplified drawing below, figure 5.10, use arrows along the outside edge of the globe to diagram the vertical movement of air within these pressure systems, rising off or subsiding down. So as I move to this next page, we have this great drawing here. By us being able to learn these regions of air moving up and down, we're going to be able to learn more about what I cover in my courses are these cells, these Hadley, Farrell, and Polar cells, which help move this air, which is part of this multi cell model. So then it says to move forward. Uh, to answer the following questions, refer to the global barometric pressure map, uh, known it's an appendix 5.3 at the end of this lab and the one 5.1. Uh, we may require you to use Google Earth to access these maps, but I have them here at the end in the appendix. Um, the instructions on how to do this are also available in the appendix 5.5. So question 14 says, which of the four hemispheric pressure areas do you see offshore in the Pacific Ocean near California on the July map? So if I go there real quick, I'm gonna skip all the way to the end, and you can see that we have these maps. Here's, oops, excuse me. So you skip around. Um, appendix 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, and 5.4. So these are some different maps that you can definitely use to solve those questions that we have at hand. I'm going to scroll back up here. Oop, too far. There we go. Which moves us into prevailing winds. So now that you've learned of the major pressure systems at different latitudes, you will now explore how these pressure systems contribute to larger global patterns of wind, referred to as the prevailing winds. Figure 5.11, which is observed below, is a simplified drawing of the Earth with predominant latitudes labeled. So question 16 says, across the corresponding latitudes on this figure below, add several large H's for high pressure systems and several lar large L's for low pressure systems and these will correspond with the global pressure systems you've identified above in figure 5.1. Again, if I'm starting to lose you, make sure you watch Scott's video from above uh, in the guided practice video and that will certainly help plug in this information here. Essentially what we're doing here is we're starting to take all the information throughout this lab and kind of plugging in. To be honest, I know this is a really long lab, we're only about halfway through it, but it's because it's mostly images and we're taking these smaller pieces and we're gluing them together, we're putting them together so that way we can observe it in one larger diagram. All right. Question 17, based on the three main factors of primary circulation, pressure gradient, Coriolis effect, and friction, draw arrows on your map as well. And uh, question 18 says, uh, 5.11, with the following prevailing winds, label the northeast trade winds, southeast trade winds, prevailing winds, and polar easterlies. What's important to know about those is that the name comes from the origin in which it's, you know, the, the origin of that wind. So the northeast trade winds mean that the winds were coming from the northeast trade winds, uh, northeast trade area as well. Then we can add one more, the ITCZ, the Intertropical Convergent Zone. So your completed figure above, 5.11, shows a low pressure at the equator. This simplifies real world, world conditions in order to help you understand prevailing winds you can advance your understanding by recognizing the following facts. So it provides you some information about the ITCZ, which becomes very important when, it, when we start looking about tropical uh, storms and weather environments. So here we can see the ITCZ on figure 5.12, and we can see that it does change position between January and July. So question 19 says, apply what you've learned. Why do you think the ITCZ shifts to the north uh, in July and shifts to the south in January. And then question part B says, using your critical thinking skills, how does the ITCZ affect prevailing winds? Again, I know this was a lot. You know, be sure to scroll back up, check out Scott's video, because that will certainly kind of plug in some of those missing elements and also refer to your textbook and your lectures to kind of answer those missing pieces in between. That being said, that wraps up th that part, and now we're going to move towards part E. So part E is global pressure and temperature patterns. This part here has got a lot more graphing, kind of similar to what we did earlier on in this lab. So just you know, be patient and we'll be able to work through it. Now it says, question 20, using the data provided on the July global air pressure and temperature map, appendix 5.1 and 5.2 at the end of this lab, 
record the needed data in table 5.5. So let me scroll down here to the table. Here's table 5.5. You need to fill in the rest of these pieces. So some have been done for you utilizing the data on those maps that are found at the end of this lab. You will plug in the remaining pieces. Part question 21 says now plot the pressure and temperature trends along the 140 west longitude on the graph provided below. So what you're going to do is once you take the data that's needed to plug in here, you're going to then plot it on this graph down here. So again, this is July temperature and pressure along 140 degrees west longitude. And from that, you're going to collect all this data at these different latitudes to just, you know, plug, to really essentially we're trying to plot this map that we're going to be able to observe how things change in one, really in July, but across the entire globe. Um, make sure you take your time and also, and, you know, as you notice, we're using the about sign, you know, so it is, it, you're doing a rough guesstimate, but make sure it's as accurate as you possibly can because it makes it easier for you to plot it on the graph below. Now we can see that question 22, 23, 24, 25, all are referencing that map, that plotting that you just did. So make sure you complete that first. Question 26 says, using the data provided on the January global air pressure map 5.3 to 5.4, record the missing information for this. So this is along 60 degrees north, and then we can see that we provide all of the longitudes that you're gonna plug in next. So we need the January temperature, pressure, and is it area on the land or is it on the ocean? So you'll plug all of that data in. And then once you do that, we're gonna be able to plot it here on figure 5.14. So plot that pressure and temperature trends along that latitude on the graph below. Using a green pencil to plot air pressure values using the left-hand vertical axis, and then draw your green line connecting all of your points. Then use the red pencil to plot temperature values using the right-hand vertical axis. So as you see, these values here on these lines represent the pressure, these represent the temperature. So, you know, even though it's on the same line, they represent two different things. So just make sure that you're using those different colors. It makes it so much easier for us when we're grading these labs, but it also makes it easier for you to be able to see if there's any patterns that you need to be observing. Question 28, 29, and 30 all have you reflect on your observations and interpretation of figure 5.14. Now it says, referring back to the pressure maps, again at the end of this lab, and I'll show you before I move on to part F, uh, January and July, notice that in some locations the isobars are very close to one another. In other areas, the isobars are very far apart. When isobars are close to one another, this indicates a stronger pressure gradient, resulting in stronger winds. Where the isobars are spaced further apart, there is less severe pressure gradients resulting in lighter, more mild winds. So you'll be able to answer questions based on that. So let me scroll again, again, 5.3 and 5.1 respectively. Whoop. Here's 5.3 and 5.1. So I know that uh, for me in this perspective, I know that it's, you know, it's vertical versus horizontal. So it's much easier to flip that image around. But again, it's having you make reference to those maps and those certain areas, you know, since I'm here, I can point them out. Look at how far away these isobars are from one another, yet how close they are here. And so it's having you kind of do that observation and interpretation of that information. There we go. Anyway, so that being said, that wraps up that part of the lab. And now we'll move towards part F. All right. So now we're looking at local and regional wind patterns. So we've really been speaking about things very broad. <laughs> we're looking at global circulation patterns big wind systems and pressure systems. Well, what about what we experience here on the home front, right here at our homes? So we can look more at a local and regional wind pattern. So the first thing we're gonna start off with, which is constantly a question that occurs, the difference between onshore and offshore breezes. So as we can see, it says, I'm gonna just skip right down here to this paragraph. Although exposed to the same amount of solar energy, land masses become warmer than water during the day. This causes the overlying air to become warmer. This warmer air begins to rise, creating a slightly low pressure system, and this draws air in off of the ocean. These are referred to onshore breezes. So onshore breezes mean that because of the rising air on the land, air from the ocean is able to come on. Now, that being said, 
we can move forward and go the overlying air may cool and subside, meaning that it sinks, creating higher pressure over the land. This higher pressure over the land may cause the wind to blow offshore, known as an offshore breeze. So question 33 is having you decide whether we're looking at an onshore or offshore system. Moving forward, we can look at question number 34. Applying what you've, you've learned so far, imagine that you're standing on Stern's Wharf in Santa Barbara, California, on a July afternoon. Would you expect the wind to be blowing towards the land or towards the ocean, and why? Question 35. Applying what you've known. But what if you are on Angel Island State Park in San Francisco Bay? You wake up just before sunrise. Would you expect the wind to be blowing towards the Golden Gate Bridge, towards the ocean, or towards Richmond and the rest of California. Explain your reasons why. Again, I'm going to scroll up. This explains what ends up happening. Think about the course of the day, the energy that's absorbed, the energy that's being released, that difference of hot and cold, that air moves. So that'll help kind of paint that picture, I think, a little bit. Other types of local winds that we can talk about are mountain valley breezes. So another diurnal pattern that can be observed throughout California are the mountain valley breezes. During the day, the sun and the slopes of the mountain will warm the surface and the overlying air. The warmer air will begin to rise, pulling with it some of the lower air from the valley floor. This causes a general movement of air up the slope and canyons during the daytime. These are called valley breezes. At nighttime, the air will then cool, become more dense, and it will begin to sink, which will then create mountain breezes. Again, answer the questions from 36 regarding that. And then we can move into 37 using your critical thinking skills. If we were in a forest and a fire was burning on the slope of the hill, what impacts might a mountain valley breeze have on that fire? In two to three sentences, discuss the conditions during daytime and nighttime. Another thing that I certainly deal with where I live are the Santa Ana winds. What's interesting is the Santa Ana ends, uh, winds refer to the winds that would come out of Santa Ana, but now it's become a term that covers a more broader spect of this wind system. Typically between March and October, there is periodically a cooler air mass that settles over central Nevada. Although still fairly dry, this cooler air is more dense, resulting in a high pressure system over Nevada. This can at times be compounded with low pressure systems over the Pacific, generating a significant pressure gradient. So what does that mean? Well, in this diagram here you know, that Scott made for us, we can see this very high desert, cool, dry air, high pressure is being forced down, so it's moving, being pushed away, but then on top of that, the ocean itself, that region is pulling air as well, so you're kind of getting pulled on both sides, so it starts to escalate, and we end up with these very, very warm, by compression, aggressive winds, and then for us in Southern California, Santa Ana ends are all Santa Ana winds rather are always associated with fire season. Dry, hot, fast air. Moving forward to this next piece, uh, the end result for Southern California is a seasonal hot and dry wind. Unfortunately, this can occur after long dry summers. So here we look at a pattern map. Uh, this is a topographic map that we're going to apply these patterns. So on the map provided, figure 5.18, draw lines indicating the flow of wind in the diagram Santa Ana conditions. Note the winds will be more likely to move through the passes and through the canyons. Then, on question number 39, based on the map provided above, what natural areas, forests, grassland, etc., are more susceptible to Santa Ana winds in California? Your response should be between two and three sentences in length. So what we've done is we've explained what the Santa Ana winds are, where they originate from, and how they work. So now we've set you up with a topographic map with the you know with just the high and low pressure in place. So where would the winds be forced to go? Where would they shoot from? Where would they go to? Uh, take topography certainly into correspondence because it's not always going to go over mountains. It's going to look for those valleys, those we're going to look for the, the arroyos and the canyons themselves in order to transfer that high to low pressure system. Another you know, more localized system that we can look at are monsoonal winds. When you hear the word monsoonal, imagine floods and torrential rains may come to mind, but monsoonals can also be incredible times of dryness for certain areas. A monsoon is a seasonal change in wind and rain patterns observed in essentially specific parts of the world. So we can move on to this next page. 
and we can look at this these examples of the monsoons or the seasonal reversal winds. So this first one is showing a stronger solar radiated location. So we have that warmer air mixed with the low pressure. So we're going to be seeing extreme precipitation, extreme weather. Also, we have high pressure, uh, cooler oceans. So we can see there's a pattern that that is developed here. On the other side, we have weaker solar radiation. So we can see there's higher pressure being forced inward and lower pressure out in the ocean so we can see that, that moisture is actually being pulled away from the cool land surfaces and heading towards elsewhere. So we find in a lot of these systems that it's very common that one area will receive extreme precipitation and other areas will be the opposite and they will experience drought. Now Dr. Angela Rowe uh, was writing for what wrote for the Globe program 2011 explains that the most well-known monsoon occurs in Asia where the high elevation of the Tibetan plateau extending on average 5,000 meters in height above the sea level enhances the temperature difference between land and water the Asian monsoon influences a large percentage of Asia. That being said, yes, those regions receive incredible amounts of precipitation. So you would think they would have plentiful amounts of water. And they do in some senses, but their water is incredibly, incredibly contaminated. And that's something that you can talk about in your world regional geography courses. So here we have another great diagram. Uh, this is showing the classic monsoonal distribution map, uh, specifically over in Asia and Africa. We have, again, check it out. Uh, you can go ahead and scan that QR code or click that hyperlink, taking you to NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center for a quick introduction on the variables that influences monsoons. So you can continue to read more about monsoons, special uh, seasons and months in which they occur in certain regions across the globe. And then we start to see some additional uh, questions. This map here in particular, 5.21, uh, is showing a precipitation map between June and July in 2020. So we can see question 40. 100 centimeters is approximately 39 inches of precipitation. Search the internet to find the annual precipitation of where you live. And how does that relate to monsoonal amounts? Question 41, 42, 43, and 44 are either asking you to reflect on this bigger piece or asking you to label the January and July positions of the ITCZ on this diagram here and see does that play a role in monsoonal weather. Then question 43 says to draw four arrows across the map showing the direction of the winds using a blue pencil for the winds in January, a red pencil for July, and then to then apply what you've now drawn. Now, I know I've been kind of skipping through these questions because you can read them on your own. But remember, a lot of these are asking to use very specific colored pencils to represent certain things on these diagrams. So make sure you're following through with that because it's going to help you then answer these apply what you learn pieces, which are essentially your short answer response to all the work that you've done. So then we get to wrap up with our appendixes. And that's the end. So I hope this was helpful. I know that, you know, especially when we get towards the end, this gets a little more challenging because you're now applying everything you've learned throughout the lab. So I know it's going to take some more time. You know, remember, you can always reference additional uh, videos that are shared within the lab, especially if they're the learning type where you can scan it and it shows you the step by step. You can always comment below. Please like the video if you liked it. And again, this is an open resource education textbook for those that are new. So if you are looking for a free lab manual, this is part of the instructional video for some of those labs. You can check out that link below. Uh, and that being said, thank you so much, and we'll talk soon on the next lab.